Welcome back, everyone. We have our second panel session of the day now, which will be chaired by Dr. Adam Reed, who I will uh, briefly introduce to you. Adam Reed is the External Affairs Director at Suez Recycling and Recovering, Recovery sorry, UK. He's been there for four years, following a successful careers in academia, local government consultancy, going back some 25 years. For the last three years, he's been leading Suez's work with the UK government on the development of the new English resources and waste strategy. He's also the current president and indeed the 105th president of the Chartered Institutions of Waste Management. Over to you, thank you, Adam. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, although this panel is looking a bit light at the moment, so I'll fill the gap and then we'll get Kirsty to, to, to share her insights. I have been here all day, sitting in the background. Um, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed what I've heard. Um, I've not enjoyed what I've seen, but that's okay, because you can read the slides later, can't you? Um, so much good work, so much linked work. I mean, I thought this morning's session, you know, set the scene very nicely in terms of, you know, where some of the thinking is and what, where some of the issues lie. And I thought this afternoon, you know, it's all about place. It's all about policy. It's all about connectivity, if you like, something that I'm quite keen on. So um, I'll reflect on that session very briefly in a moment. But yeah, a little word about me. You've heard, you've heard all the key headlines. I have been in the sector far too long. Uh, Ex-academic, um, frustrated academic. Um, all those research reports didn't really change policy, did they? So I decided I was going to go into industry and, and, and become a consultant where I could answer real world questions. And a lot of those ended up with sustainable waste management strategies that then became uh, what you might call circular economy strategies or sustainability strategies, depending on whether I was working for private sector or municipalities. So I've been on that journey, but the last four years, I've got to be honest with you, working in a waste management company, and there you go, I've said it. It's a rude word, isn't it, waste? Um, but, I'm, but I don't work in a waste management company. I work in a resource management company, and my job is to make the circular economy tick because I take material and I move it from a place of low value, low interest, to a place of high value, high interest. And if I can get that material in high quality, then that circular loop works really well. And things like organics, I can do that. Things for some plastics, I can do that. Even paper, I can do that. What I can't do is I can't do alchemy. I am no magician. So if you give me, industry, business, householder, a pile of what you might call mixed recyclables, I'm not going to be able to turn it into gold. I've got to try and separate it. I've got to try and clean it. I've got to try and do something positive with it. But all the time I'm doing that, I'm putting energy in, I'm putting effort in. It's costing money to do so. So the ultimate, the ultimate to closing the loop on, on the circular economy from a recycling perspective, where a lot of the conversation was this morning, is about quality feedstock being sourced at point. So when you put it in the bin, you put it in the paper bin, you put it in the plastics bin, you put it in the organics bin, because then I can capture it in my lorry, lorries, compartments on lorries, in a way that means I never reduce the quality. And then you can go local reprocessing, local closed loop, local remanufacture, etc. So really important. And I would also stress that the last two years, we've spent most of our time developing a reuse hub and a reuse network. Now, how are you looking at me going, what on earth is a waste management company doing playing with reuse? Well, the social value of every tonne of material we put through reuse is something like 150 times more than the social value through recycling the same tonnage. Simples. Now, if I'm working with municipalities who are very, very keen on social value, they're keen because they've got poor communities, they've got communities with lack of access, they've got lots of students or, 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 or families on low income, they can't buy even IKEA furniture but what they can do is get refurbished furniture through my charity shops so my reuse hub in manchester which has just opened it the largest one in europe is processing literally hundreds of thousands of tons of things that have been put out for reuse or repair and we're working with charities like recycling lives and bikes for lives local uh, uh, carpenters not only putting apprenticeships in place tick a box but also making sure a lot of that material goes back to a good second or third home. And I think that's really important when you go circularity, that's not really a waste stream, is it? That's a material just being put in the right place at the right time. Give it a clean, maybe you need a few screws, simple. So that's why I'm here, that's why I'm interested. And that's why I've been thoroughly enjoying listening to all of you great researchers doing some fantastic work. Um, 
And then there's the, the other side of my life. Yeah, I am the president of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management. I'm not wearing the chain today. I thought that was a little bit overkill for, uh, for the audience, but I, I do have one. And, um, and that just sounds wrong, doesn't it? The Chartered Institution of Waste Management. I'm so end of pipe, I'm not interesting. It's not true. It's not true because actually we've got people that are into eco design. We've got people that are into eco taxation. There are members who specialize in reuse and repair. So actually with a chartered institution of resource management, just not in name because changing your charter is quite difficult. The queen has to approve it. So that's the journey that the sector is going on. The sector is going, we don't want to be the end of pipe. We don't want to be the waste manager of tomorrow. That leaves us as a, as a, a marginal business a marginal sector, low skilled, low priority. We want to be the hub of the circular economy, working with logistics, working with designers, working with big brands under things like EPR. You've already heard about that. That's where we need to sit in the heart of that transition because the green economy, the circular economy, the resource efficient economy, they're not all the same, are they? The sustainable economy, it needs materials in the right place at the right time. It needs a change of perspective it needs to address consumption issues and i think that's why the institution that i represent today is a good place to be but anyway enough about me and why i'm here thank you very much for giving me five minutes right i'm going to crack on what we're going to do is hopefully we're going to have a few panelists otherwise uh kirsty and i are just going to put the world to rights um they each of them are going to have 10 minutes or so reflect on why they are into uh circular economy resource management in a broader sense and then maybe reflect a little bit on what we've heard in this afternoon's previous session some good research in there, some interesting different scales, you know, local, regional, national, global, some issues in there about the role of um, uh, social enterprises, which I might come back to later. I've got a pet, pet project on that one. Um, the role of big corporates even, because I thought I was getting my, uh, my ears bashed a little bit earlier listening to the, some of the commentary, which was good. So we'll do that. We'll get some questions for the Crest team. We'll get some questions into each of the panelists and then we'll get you finished on time so that's my job is to make sure we finish on time and i keep everybody busy so thank you first up i'm going to welcome uh well in my order it says dr patrick schroeder from chatham house patrick are you there can we see you hello patrick you're on mute yes hello i'm here i just joined um fabulous well on the other session okay um I hope you can hear me okay, that my okay. sound is all right. Um, so, yeah, first of all, thanks for inviting me to, uh, to join uh, today. Um, I listened to the afternoon presentations and actually, yeah, congrat congratulations to all, uh, all the presenters and, and your um, research projects. I think they're, they're all really exciting. Um, and I think from, from my perspective also, they're all real, really cutting edge, um, touching upon really critical questions in, in the circular economy. And um, I've, I've uh, learned a lot um, listening uh, to this, and it relates to a number of areas also that I'm working at. Um, maybe just to uh, briefly say a few words about my work, um, how I have come to the circular economy as a, as a topic and as an as a area of, of my work. So I, I started working on the circular economy about 10 years ago when I worked in uh, international cooperation programs, which were funded by the uh, European Union, and I was based in Asia, and we promoted uh, circular economy uh, solutions in various sectors uh, in small and medium-sized enterprises uh, in uh, countries ranging from India and uh, China. We we're working on energy efficiency, um, but also different types of um, approaches in the textile industry uh, to recycle water from manufacturing processes and um, so that was my my entry point and um, later I worked then at IDS the Institute of Development Studies uh, at the University of Sussex as a uh, researcher and, and lecturer and um, I stuck with the circular economy topic and um, the way I tried to focus it was to look at how the circular economy can contribute to uh, achieving the sustainable development goals. That was around 2015, 2016, when those goals were adopted by the United Nations. And um, I tried to highlight in that context also 
already the, uh, the social issues around informal work and the need for uh, building skills, uh, but also looking at issues around inequality. And um, now, more recently, since I've um, moved to Chatham House, um, where I lead the circular economy research, uh, we've been looking at uh, these interconnected issues um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the international context of the circular economy, in looking at how um, national policies around the world have been developing over the last few years outside the EU. And we've seen a range of activities um, in Latin America, Africa, uh, ASEAN, uh, India, where increasingly governments are taking up um, EPR policies, which, which were also discussed um, earlier on, um, but also uh, developing action plans and roadmaps. And um, furthermore, we're looking also at, at these issues, how to finance uh, circular economy transitions, really, um, not only business models, but also um, other uh, initiatives um, that, that are circular. And finally, we, we're trying to understand also the role of global trade uh, in, in the circular economy, what it means for the existing uh, trade that we see a lot of this, as we know, is um, informal um, or even some illegal waste shipments. Um, but in, in which ways will the trade system need to change to, to support uh, a circular economy? And now moving, moving to some of the um, uh, presentations. Um, so there are some uh, takeaways um, from my side that, that I wanted to mention. And uh, the first one, maybe if I um, start with that, this is the uh, circular economy concept. Um, uh, sorry, the circular society concept. Um, so I was very pleased to, to see that. Um, and it's, it's very encouraging to see that the social, social dimensions of the um, circular economy are receiving uh, more attention. And this is a really important development uh, to expand the uh, traditional circular economy um, to, with its focus on uh, materials, industrial processes, or, or business models towards the um, more social aspects. Um, however, what I... Um, wouldn't really want to see is uh, to have a split between some people talking about the circular economy, whereas others then start discussing a circular society, so that we have then a split between maybe the engineering and technology community on the one hand, and social and political science, or uh, communities working on the circular society and, and the social transformations. So I'm... Um, um, I can, I can understand, and I'm sometimes also thinking about this, whether um, there has been, is there too much corporate capture in the way of the circular economy agenda? Is it, is it located too firmly in the uh, neoliberal growth paradigm? Um, and I can, I can understand there are concerns. And um, however, generally, I see circular economy uh, and, and circular society these are, in a way, two sides of the same coin. So if we if we do want um, systemic change, so we require both um, the technology innovation um, on the one hand, uh, so engineering solutions, et cetera, but also the social innovations on the other side. Um, so I, I think the strength of the, the circular economy at the moment is that it's broad enough to accommodate um, all of these various uh, perspectives um, that come in. And um, in relation to this, um, the other big question that, that was raised uh, in, in the discussions earlier is whether we can have growth in the circular economy. So um, that's, that's a really big question. And um, I've, I've been thinking about that myself. And I, I try to approach it the following way. So I'm trying to think through which sectors and which business models might need to shrink if we, as, as we're moving from a linear to a, a circular model. And um, on the other hand, which sectors and which types of businesses will, will need to grow to enable uh, circularity? And um, so what we know, we can look at the energy transition and, and get, get an idea uh, where we see, obviously, fossil fuels and, and the industries around that, they need to shrink and even phase out eventually. Um, 
So in the same way we could see um, circular business models based on yeah, concepts and approaches of planned obsolescence don't seem to have uh, a bright future as, as we transition to a circular system. Um, so, and related to that, there's also then the global perspective and where we then come also to this area in which I'm working um, that's more related to the international collaboration, the international cooperation part of, of the circular economy. And um, so I was very interested to see uh, the, the discussion about um, and how the presentations, everything was arranged, connecting uh, both the local and the global and the different levels and scales. Um, and it's also something that we saw in the videos, which were shown in, in, in the break, that there's not one circular economy as, as a monolithic um, type of approach, but they're actually many, many diverse circular economies. Um, and um, so the, the presentation by, um, by Kaustip, where we look at uh, the issue of leakage and trade and, and waste and, and secondary materials. Um, so what's happening outside the EU, EU in terms of e-waste trade and um, how, how this links to Nigeria. Um, this, is, uh, this is also quite relevant for, for our work. Um, and, and a lot more actually need, needs to happen to, to make this happen um, or to, to, um, to close this leakage, which was shown so, uh, so nicely in the, in the diagram, actually. The question is, where do we close the loop? Do we close it within the EU or actually do we expand the loop and also integrate um, the other countries? Um, and I think that's, that's the important way to go, that the circular economy does not become uh, an approach that's maybe too much focused on national competitiveness or uh, kind of issues around national uh, resource nationalism, but we really take a co collaborative and global approach to try and solve this. And there are um, a number of things happening. Um, uh, with, in relation to e-waste and things that we're following with some interest. So um, at the moment, uh, e-waste is not very well um, uh, recorded uh, globally. So there's a lot of um, uh, intransparency, how it flows. And um, to that, uh, to solve this issue, a new development now by the World Customs Organization is that there will be new HS codes coming for e-waste. Uh, uh, in January 2022. So this is a good development, uh, which will provide some more transparency um, in the international trade of e-waste. And um, also smartphones will all also get their own subheading. So based on that, we will have uh, better statistics to, um, to be able to, uh, for traceability and, and transparency, and also design the right trade policies, but also the right national policies which are then again linked to EPR. Um, maybe uh, just one thing, I think my time is running out. Uh, so it was mentioned several times, uh, the just transition. This is also something that we are um, very, we think is very important um, to have a just transition framework for the circular economy uh, to identify both the opportunities that reduce waste and emissions and improve resource efficiency and stimulate product design and innovation, but at the same time also to, uh, to have this framework to create jobs, contribute positively to um, human development, but also um, understand the potential negative impacts of industrial restructuring when economies shift towards circularity and um, also to prevent efforts to promote circular economy, uh, circular circularity that doesn't fall onto the poor um, through worsening working conditions or, or health impacts or, or actually reduce livelihoods or then uh, or job losses. And um, to that, we've actually uh, developed uh, a framework, I think maybe some initial exploration of what such a just transition framework for the circular economy could look like. And I um, can post that in the chat, um, but I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, I hope I didn't take up too much time. 
Not at all, Patrick. Thanks very much. Um, and you've summarised some really important issues that came out of that session earlier. Um, and uh, and, and if, if nothing else, some connectivity between you and your framework and some of the researchers may well just be the exact fruit that we were hoping for from a session like today. So fantastic. Thank you. Um, I was really fascinated by, you know, that discussion earlier about region and city hubs and national and global. And I think, you know, bottoming out how many material specific loops there may or may not be and, and how they're interconnected is going to be quite critical for any transition, not, not, not only a just transition, because if we, if we don't understand that fully, I think some of our endeavours may, may fall flat on their face because they just don't quite work. Um, and, and, I, and I love the idea of cities becoming regional hubs for, for material flows, but we also have to accept that some of those material flows will never work locally. So, you know, a circular loop at one scale is, is still better than a non-circular loop. So I think, you know, I think that that's going to be an interesting uh, area of research as we go forward. But anyway, I'll come back to you, Patrick, in a moment. Next on my list, I'm going to go to, uh, yeah, Kirsty's been waiting long enough. Dr. Kirsty Hobson from Cardiff University. Good afternoon, Kirsty. How are you? Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Yes, I have been waiting patiently like a good soldier. Um, so yes, I'm from Cardiff University. I am a reader in human geography at the School of Geography and Planning at Cardiff, which basically means I'm a social scientist. I have a background in anthropology and human geography. And I started looking at the circular economy about, it is about a decade ago now, because my research since hmm, sort of late 90s has been looking at sustainable consumption more over than production. And so I was part of a project called Clever, which is called Closed Loop Emotionally Valuable E-Waste Recovery, which was working with engineers and designers and um, um, chemists, that's what I was looking for actually looking at electronic waste and particular business models. So I was kind of the token, it was a EPSRC funded project and I was the token social scientist on, on a panel of, of scientists, which is always fun. You kind of like, you're not understood, but you also can get away with a lot of stuff as well. So, that, so what I was doing is basically thinking, well, what is it that people think about electronic waste and what are their reactions to uh, particular business models? But that aside, when I started looking at the circular economy about a decade ago, I was thinking, well, this is very interesting because there's a kind of what I would say evangelical approach by, by sort of some advocates of it towards it, that this was going to be the answer to all our worries. And of course, that gets one's, one's ears poking up if you are a researcher. And it's not just about um, looking at the diagram, you know, the butterfly diagram and going, oh, where's that loop going and where's that loop going? It's as much about who is advocating and why are they advocating this particular model? So that got me really interested. And as Patrick touched upon before, is, that, is this really that different from the sustainable development and the green economy and all the stuff that's come before it? Now, I don't say that conceptually because I know there's a rich history of industrial ecology and design thinking behind a lot of the circular economy. I'm talking about the way it is advocated, the way it is mobilized in policy, the way it has been framed, as, as Patrick said, you know, very much a sort of pro-growth um, perspective. And many crit critical thinkers, including my own colleagues, have just written off the circular economy as just yet another iteration of you know, capital accumulation under neoliberal capitalism and all of that. And on the one hand, I agree, but I like to wear many hats. But on the other hand, I don't agree with them. I think it's way more interesting than that. So I just want to come back to a comment that Pauline made at the last, at the end of the last session. And she was saying, well, the social transformation isn't taking place. And I think we can all agree that, you know, that is that is definitely the correct evaluation. But I suppose I want to be a little bit provocative and, you know, perhaps less polite than some of the people who've come before me and ask us all, not just Pauline or, or, or you as researchers, but all of us, why do we expect it to? Why do we think the circular economy and those advocating it are able to and willing to and wanting to bring in the kind of social transformations that we all want to happen. And again, I say that to be a bit provocative, but you know, are the people leading the circular economy charge, people who are, who are known for wanting social and environmental you know, equality? I ask that as a genuine question. So I guess my, my own reflections back is I'd like to hear more from the researchers and the project about what your political ecology is of 
um, circular economy. And really what we're talking about here is power. I haven't heard much today really about that idea of where the power is actually sitting. And one of the previous speakers said that we talk about the circular economy and not the circular society, and that's a failure of imagination. I don't think it's about imagination. There's plenty of imagination going on out there. I think it's about our inability to address the gross uh, power inequalities that exist in this world, that the gross consolidation of wealth and power that we all know exists, but it's kind of the elephant in the room with a lot of things. So maybe we need to like say hello to the elephant and introduce it to ourselves and have a chat about it. Um, and I keep thinking, Timothy Mitchell's book, Carbon Democracy, keeps coming into my head. I don't know if you know it, but basically he talks about the way that we tend to assume that, you know, we get we have our energy systems and our economic systems over here and then we have our political systems over there. But actually, they're so mapped onto each other that when the politics, sorry, when, when, the, when we got our energy from coal and then it changed to gas, that changed the global geopolitics and also national politics. So as we think about changing to more renewable energies, as we think about changing these systems, we also have to think about what kind of politics is being created by these different systems of provision. So again, that's what I'm saying about political ecology or the circular economy. I wonder where that is and what that might actually um, look like. But I don't want to go on some kind of neo-Marxist rant here because, you know, that's very easy to do and that's not necessarily that interesting. What I was thinking was um, another book. So Hall and Soskis wrote a book called Varieties of Capitalism about 20 years ago, where they were basically saying that economic geography and they were basically saying you basically have liberal market economies over here and this is a horrible generalization but it actually does map quite well so you've got australia the uk etc very liberal and then you've got what they call coordinated market economies which tend to be you know germany etc um, and france and i was thinking that example of holden strasbourg like why did holden strasbourg have those different um, kind of responses to the territoriality and that maps really nicely onto that concept of varieties of capitalism what i think is really interesting in some ways places like hull are trying to become coordinated um, economies inside liberal economies and that actually is extremely challenging because you're trying to do capitalism in two very different ways in the same place and i wonder if that analytical lens could be quite useful for us to think about the challenges that places like hull um, are coming up against and also places like wales so i'll just finish off talking a little bit about about wales um, for those of you who don't know much about Wales, we are a small country. There's 3.13 million of us living here now. We've got a devolved government. We do have the third highest recycling rate in the world, which the Welsh government is extremely proud of. And we do have an active circular economy projects and policies. But we also have some other very interesting and progressive laws and policies. So we have the 2015 Wellbeing and Future Generations Act, which actually requires all public bodies in Wales, NHS, et cetera, et cetera, to put long term sustainability at the forefront of their thinking. How they do that, of course, is another matter, but it's there. It's there within one of the central pillars of um, how Wales is now being governed, which is very, very interesting in its own itself. And we have lots of in, uh, social enterprises, repair cafes. We also have 11 Benthig. Benthig is the Welsh word to mean borrowing. So that's the library of things in Wales. And we've also got lots of work going on around food, social enterprises and mobility. But um, to pick up Walter Steyerhill's analogy this morning about longing for the sea, these people that I've talked to who run Benthig, and who are doing the food networks these are the people who are longing for the sea but when they turn around to go and collect the wood and build the boats like do the practical nitty-gritty stuff of making this work making you know social enterprises work then it becomes extremely challenging so how can we help them and what how can we think differently how can we you know um, challenge our own imaginaries if you like about how these different systems can work together and certainly I've seen the activists and the people involved in SMEs, you know, they're passionate, they're overworked, they're underpaid, they're trying to navigate complex economic, legal and social institutions 
and norms. They're trying to become the sum of their, you know, more than the sum of their parts by coordinating. And I know, I know some of the talks touched on this, and I'm just, you know, agreeing that I've seen that myself as well. I think one dangerous thing with the circular economy discourse is it tends to think that we can lean on these people and these organizations to do the social transformation for us, whilst actually not necessarily thinking about how that then connects to the different forms of power going on. We can't expect them to do the heavy lifting. And so I've been challenging myself to think about, well, what are some of the different ways I could say to the Welsh government, you know, this is how you need to help these social enterprises. And I know one of the talks touched upon this in terms of, you know, capacity building, etc. And I agree. But I wonder if there's more. And I just had this idea before that, you know, living in South Wales, we have some quite deprived areas up in the valleys, the old coal areas. And there's lots of business parks up there. So the government, the local authorities are very willing to put public money into building business parks so businesses can locate. Wouldn't it be interesting if those kinds of models were rolled out for social enterprises because they just get a year or two funding to be able to make themselves you know, um, viable as an institution, then off you go, do your thing. What if actually we were able to offer them the same support that we actually offer to businesses? I don't know how that would go down, but I'm happy to have that conversation with the Welsh government. So, yeah, I just want to throw that sort of out to everybody. What are our what are our sort of theories of power here? What what is the political ecology of the circular economy? And what if we can think outside the box in terms of challenging our own imaginaries about what might be possible? What are some of the ideas um, we can put forward to have like a productive and constructive engagement with circular economy? work and activists and politicians so i'll stop there thank you wow so many questions in there i hope the cresting team were, were making some notes and are starting to think hard because because they're going to get hammered in a minute with when i start asking them what do they think about the power ecology um and, and what can they do to support government um and, and you're right we do need to think outside the box actually the circular economy would never fit in a box would it we're gonna have to smash the box and, and put it inside a, a sphere so let's start talking about thinking outside the sphere. Um, uh, Kirsty, there's so much really good stuff in there. And I think it's great that we got a, a, a human geographer. I too was a human geographer before I became an environmentalist. Uh, now I'm just a capitalist um, and, and trying to make it circular at the same time. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's a, that's, a, that's a tough ask, but I'm working on it. Um, and, and I should say, I'd, I'd like to thank the Royal Geographical Society for hosting today. I am a fellow of the RGS, um, and I was in I was in the hallowed halls not that long ago, and I'm, I'm just a little bit sorry that COVID got in the way of me being there today, but COVID is getting in the way of a lot of things, including, um, you know, the, the anti-plastics brigade that, that was gaining so much traction uh, before lockdown and the reuse uh, agenda and the refill agenda and all of those other things that are far more circular than recycling. So, um, you know, roll on the end of COVID when we can start to put some of these... Uh, activities back to the fore right i made a note Kirsty. by the way got some good questions for the uh, uh for the researchers final panelists as i as i sit here the bar's been set high we have dr olawali oliaidi from the university of ibadan how are you i'm great good evening from ibadan uh, even though i'm <laughs> outside the city now <laughs> how are you doing too good to see you very good. Looking forward to uh, your 10 minute reflection on, on what you've heard so far and, and what you're doing with the circular economy. Thank you very much, Edan. Uh, I'm Olawali Olaide, as it's been said, uh, from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, the best university in Nigeria for your information. Um, I'm also the president of Circular Economy, Africa Circular Economy Research and Policy Network. Uh, uh, in that space, uh, I coordinate uh, most of the activities on research and policy uh, because we have realized over time that uh, there's usually a disconnect between uh, research and policy. So we want our research uh, to feed into policy and see actions on the ground. Uh, that said, uh, uh, also, maybe I should talk briefly about this ESAPIN, that is Africa Circular Economy uh, Policy Network. We organize that many events, including an annual event on Secularity Africa. Uh, so you may be interested to know that we had a second edition last May, and the third edition will be uh, 
next year in May between 11 and 13. So you can save the date. What we essentially use this event to do is to create awareness within the continent. Uh, I will talk briefly about what is secular economy in Africa and what is not so sec much of secular economy in Africa. And uh, maybe that would be interesting to investors and those who want to uh, uh, make a deep dive into the secular economy in the context. My, my coming into the space of secular economy actually started with uh, the person I called by my so, uh, Paul Indred. Uh, we did a book on uh, an international perspective on, on industrial ecology in 2015. Uh, in that book, we were not talking much about circular economy, but we were talking about industrial symbiosis, uh, industrial, uh, eco industrial park, and issues now, now talking more about circular economy. Uh, in that book, I, I wrote the I mean, issue around Africa. I was able to do in that book to emphasize that circular economy in Africa, to leapfrog uh, circular economy in Africa, we have to focus on the agricultural sector. So, so we talk about agri-circular economy, if you call it. But in a real context, uh, when you compare Africa and Europe, for, for instance, you will see that uh, Africa is, is not much of a circular economy perspective, not, not much into economy, but a more of a secular society. And I will tell you what I mean by this. In elsewhere in Africa, maybe Europe, you talk about reduce because there is over consumption. So, but in Africa, it's not too much of reduce because we have under consumption. Uh, in Europe, uh, other places, we talk about recycling. In Africa, we cannot talk about recycling because we don't even have energy <laughs> to, to do much of recovery that you did from recycling. So, and also elsewhere outside Africa, you talk about uh, refuse. In Africa, we cannot refuse because we don't even have enough. So it is it's essential to know that we are talking about different contexts here. And we are not talking about much of economy because Africa is poor. We are not even, uh, we cannot even make the basic need. We are not a high income uh, economy. But to actually get out of poverty, we, we have to move from um, being a secular society to being a secular economy. So what is secular society in the context of Africa? Secular society in the context of Africa means to reuse. Okay, uh, this is Christmas period. Let me just give you an, a, a scenario of growing up. Uh, when we're growing up, when we buy Christmas clothes, you will notice that it's usually oversized. The reason is that we, we know that as a child, you are still growing. And because you are poor, we cannot afford to be buying clothes. We don't even have enough clothes. So when you buy one, the new one, it has to be oversized so that in the next three, four months, as you are still growing, your body is getting to fit into the clothes. So that is what we call, uh, I would call reuse in the context of these principles of circular economy. We can also talk about regeneration. Uh, I said that we are not much of recycling, but we are much of re regeneration. And when you, look, uh, you think about the major occupation in Africa, which is agriculture, we get all our food needs, basic needs from agriculture because it is regenerating. So um, you can plant uh, seed, um, grow and harvest, and you can use the seed again to regenerate another uh, plantation as it were in the farm sector. We also need to talk about recovery. So what we do, we try to recover uh, from, I mean, uh, material uh, to elongate the use of materials from what we would do. So we, we, we can, uh, in Africa, we don't have, well, we didn't have cement or other things. We're building houses, maybe uh, uh, with mud and uh, thatch roof, but that's what people could have afforded, uh, afford at that point in time. And that's the society. Even some society in Africa, you don't, there's, even if they build a, 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 what a type of structure that you think is, 
is, is good and befitting of a city, you see how some semblance of that village setting. And in, 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 the, in, the, in the next future, I, I will begin to see a, thought, a sort of agritourism into Africa to be able to leapfrog or transit from a secular society to secular economy, whereby you can still come to Africa and see a, a typical village that you used to see in maybe in Europe or other places maybe 50 years ago that are no longer there. But Africa has a way of preserving uh, some of these cultures, not necessarily because of the economy, uh, but because of the society, because of the attachment uh, to some of these things. And it's been working and it's, it's good for the, the, the level. We talk about uh, uh, the level of development. The level of development in Africa now cannot be compared uh, to other places. So let me now coming back to cresting and what we are doing in cresting. I said we are much of a society, secular society, and less of a secular economy. We're considering a, a study on e-waste, okay? Of course, as I said, these electronics and electrical devices don't have their parent organizations in the continent. So, uh, and we create for use of these uh, gadgets, as it were, and it's for us, it's a, it's a sign of development. Because if you can now use a mobile device, for instance, you can communicate with people home and abroad. So that's a good one. But the, 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 the type of equipment that comes to the continent, especially in Nigeria, uh, West Africa, including Ghana, or maybe even East Africa, Kenya, and Southern Africa, or uh, South Africa, is that they are fairly used, okay, or reusable uh, items. But because they are close to the end of life, by the time they get here, they, when they are used for one or two years, there's nowhere to, there's nothing to do with them because the parent companies are not here. There are no company to recycle them or repair. So they become or constitute waste in, into the continent. So more or less becoming a, a dumping ground. So what we need to do is to help this situation is to what we are proposing, the ultimate uh, producer's uh, uh, responsibility uh, to pick up these issues and companies, the parent company that produce these gadgets should have a way of improving, because in a way it will also be a way of improving the economy of the continent, creating more jobs, because of course, uh, unemployment is a problem in the continent, uh, poverty is a problem in the continent, so it can help to transit from society, secular society to a circular economy on a hybrid of, of the two for the continent. So that's uh, uh, my initial contribution here. Thank you. Unmute, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting because you've helped reset the context again, which is these first world problems, talking about first world issues and actually we need to get the global right. So thank you for setting the context back in place right um i've got some questions i think that the the panelists have already raised for the uh, the cresting team so perhaps i can ask a couple of those and then we'll see if there's any questions on the q a chat forum which i can't see because i'm logged into a different system so how about cresting team let's go for have you done any thinking about just transitions and uh, are you looking forward to linking up with patrick and discussing that further as a nice simple start for 10. Do we have anybody from Cresting left? Actually, uh, yes, I have read your work, Patrick, and it's very nice to see you finally. And I've read your work on just transition connecting to Nigeria. So I'm very open to uh, have a conversation again and see where our work overlaps. There yes. you go. Very, very positive response for you, Patrick. Good. Um, Number two okay, for Cresting, then how, how about a question around power inequality to come back to Kirsty's point? Have you has anybody in the team been looking at that, or is that part of the next phase, or is that something you've just passed you by? Can you hear me? Yes, I, I can. You can. <laughs> thank you very much for your uh, question. Well, thank you all for your wonderful contributions and for your 
questions. Um, I'm addressing in particular the question from Kirsty. said she was trying to provoke me, I think, or maybe that was how uh, I could interpret it. Um, and I think it was slightly provocative, but not necessarily in the way that you were thinking it would be, because I think you were making the, the same point that I was making. This kind of is my point that a, a sustainable or a social transformation or a just transformation is not going to happen as a byproduct of policies that have come with an environmental ambition. So there's probably other conversations going on amongst sociologists in other rooms who are thinking less about the environment and more about society. And we need to sort of get together with them, uh, I suspect, um, and break the sort of the social transformation discussion out of its environmental box and putting it into a much wider box so that we can address the relevant issues of power and institutional privilege and all the things that are sort of supporting the system as we know it. I mean, effectively, the circular economy is a part of the capitalist economy. You can't extract it from that, and it will follow the same logic. So unless we come at it from a point of view that we want to change capitalism in some way, we're not going to be able to do it. Okay, fair point. I think the door's open for you, Kirsty, to, uh, to get involved a bit more. Uh, going forward, let's ask uh, one more. Um, okay, so Alawi started with a point about linking research to policy. How Sorry, closely Santiago does the group... Is having his hand on. <laughs> Sorry? I, I have a very general comment, but I, I think uh, go on, uh, ask the question for, for Wally, and then, and then I can jump in. Thank you. I can't see you, by the way. So, for a from a chairing perspective, what you're doing on in the room and on your on, on your platform is impossible to view. Um, so, bear with me. Right. Otherwise, uh, he asked the question, or he set the scene with this link to research to policy, and that there's a there's a disjoint. And I just wonder whether the the Cresting team felt that they were close to the policy discussions and were looking forward to influencing the policies this discussions, whether it be Humberside, UK, Wales, Europe. Global, I don't mind, take a pick, but I, I, you know, are you doing research for research sake or are you now aligned to the people that actually make big decisions? I can see perhaps more than Adam can see. So uh, someone in Utrecht, is that, kalstrup has got your hand up. Would you like to answer that question? Yeah, maybe uh, go back to Christy's point and also, also the question you raised now. Uh, I think power is obviously omnipresent. Uh, yeah, there's no escaping power, especially if you live within the framework of the society. And also uh, coming, sitting in a chair in academia that this kind of builds on the capitalist accumulation through centuries. It's, it's easy to criticize and be, be like have different narratives of power, but maybe one of the ways is to how to, how do academic really engage with society? For instance, we know about climate change for 30, 40 years. There's a lot of studies, but it doesn't really translate to uh, power or change. So how can we as academic, you know, uh, create knowledge that already has some social legitimacy built in so maybe that's one of my uh, epistemology and this pluriverse of epistemologies, how I approach academia. And like in my research with Nigeria or with Vietnam, I think the inequalities, the power uh, barriers are omnipresent. And some, yeah, I, I think that's, that drives the research I do as well and the kind of method I use as well. Thanks. I think, if I may, Adam, uh, I'm, I'm going to jump in. <laughs> so I don't raise my hand, but I'm just, I'm just jumping in. Um, so I have a few comments to say, and you know, I'm very glad we're kind of discussing about these because I'm an anthropologist, I'm doing research on industrial ecology, and I'm using a lot of social science to kind of analyze the circular economy. So I usually kind of get into these discussions, and, and, uh, and I love it um, because they are very... Uh, stimulating, let's say, and very, um, 
you know, they motivate us to kind of jump a bit forward uh, and, and, and kind of see a different perspective. So I have a couple of things to say. First thing, I, I really like the, the analogy that, um, that uh, Kirsty used of, you know, where of, of, of evangelical approach. Uh, it actually has happened. Uh, to me personally, uh, there was a person that was working with us. He was a, a student from, from an economics degree. And uh, we were doing this uh, transdisciplinary project, just kind of talking to the people in different towns, uh, figuring out, doing an analysis of the economic situation. How can we apply uh, different uh, approaches to understand the territory and then kind of co-create strategies for further sustainability, blah, blah, blah. And he, one comment that he made like the, the day before he, he, he finished his, uh, his uh, internship with us was, you look like evangelists. You just go like town by town and you're trying to convince people that sustainability is a thing and that, you know, we should be converted into more sustainable beings. And to a certain extent, yes, we're trying to do that, not using kind of an evangelist uh, approach, but we're just kind of using, um, and I'm touching here that the, the part of power, we're using the, the, what we call the capabilities that we have built in different territories. Uh, and here we go into very specific kind of political ecology uh, discussion, which is, uh, each one of us, like as individuals and as part of communities and the communities themselves, they have built a set of capabilities that we can use to build something that could be potentially better than what we have right now. And I'm, I'm not just thinking about environmental uh, 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 kind of sustainability. I'm thinking about kind of new ways of imagining, imagining society. And I'm joining Martin uh, like the very first thing that he said today in his presentation is that we need to reimagine this kind of society that we have and that we have the capabilities to develop more creative creative solutions for the problems that we have and this is what we're doing with the circular economy and second thing that i want to say which is related to that and the just transitions um, of that patrick was mentioning I do mobilize uh, in a certain extent uh, the transition kind of uh, paradigm. And it's more because I feel that um, the circular economy is just, it's, it's a tool, it's a transformational tool. Uh, the circular economy cannot be here forever. We've, if we do transition towards a society that really kind of respects the limits of the planet and, 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 and we stop kind of consuming more than what we have, then at that point, we won't need the circular economy as we think the circular economy today, which is we're just going to take all these waste and we're going to see a way to produce less waste and recycle and do all the arts. So we, we would stay into that, uh, into those limits. And uh, so we, I think I think I mobilized that uh, in my thesis and I'd be happy to kind of extend a bit more on that uh, one day. I think we have limited time today. Um, then just the in terms of and this is kind of more kind of a general comment on we're talking about capitalism we're talking about neo neoliberalism and something that really gave me a lot of inspiration uh, are two books from Andy Merrifield uh, the first one is called magical Marxism and it's a uh, I'm Colombian and he reflects on 100 years of solitude and he makes a parallel on how to be creative and how to analyze reality through the kind of uh, a magical realism perspective on Marxism. It's just wonderful. And the main message on, on that is saying, we need to just reimagine, we need to be creative. And the best part of it is that the solutions that could potentially change things are within our reach, is the things that we do the concepts that we use and what we do in day-to-day -day life that actually matters. It's not the research, the abstract research that's going to bring action into things. We're going to, we need to attach those kind of big theoretical things into day-to-day -day activities. And I think that's what circular economy is about and or at least should be about or I wish is about. <laughs> and, and the second thing is another book from Andy Merrifield who reflects on on, on, on Marxism as well, is 
and it's tied to what I said at the beginning about capabilities and capitals, is that uh, it's a book that's called The Amateur. And that book is just telling, we all have the power to do things. Uh, we just need to find a way to do it. So we have established very specific systems of power that control the way we think, or not control, but that guide the way we think. Um, if we are able to imagine something different, and he takes the example of, you know, amateur people doing things, they're not perfect at what they do. They try to do it, and then they generate communities, and then they generate transitions to something unknown, let's say. Um, and it's just a wonderful inspiration as well. So those two books, and I think they're, they tightly relate to what we're talking today uh, uh, and to all these kind of very um, inspiring research that we're doing, that we're finishing with, with my 14 colleagues and, 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 and or directors, um, which is about reimagining re -imagining society while using circular economy as a tool for that transition. Um, so I'd be happy to talk to all of you. I, I'm just, I'm just really loving these. I can talk for hours now, <laughs> but I'm going to stop I, here. I and, and please, Adam, you, you take the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you're right. You could talk for hours, which is good. But there's loads of other people with things to say, and we've got 15 minutes to go. And I definitely think we should follow up on your opportunity to talk offline. So there you go. There's an invitation to everybody that's on the call. There's a guy that wants to talk. Um, I've got one more question for the cresting team, and then I'm going to come back to the panel with a couple of questions. So they've been sitting here quietly, but they've been provoking thoughts. So my question for the cresting team is, what is your one ask of UK government or the European Commission to make this transformative change happen? So, you know, you've done a lot of research, you've done a lot of thinking, you've done a lot of collaborative work, you've, you've, you've you know, you've lifted up every stone and you've, you've come up with a load of, you know, new models and approaches and theories and concepts and you've looked at studies at different scales so if i'm going to get the change that you all believe is possible transformate you know transformative creative holistic um and it's going to protect protect the planet and livelihoods and communities etc what is your one ask and there's more of you than, than one so you get one each so go on let's have a quick quick fire answer but i don't want i don't want a lecture Quick fire answers. What's your one ask of government at whatever level you want it to be? Cresting team, over to you. Santi, if you've got a quick answer, I think you were first with your hand up. I think it was Kieran, but um, it's just, it just one thing. It's rethink of, on value. Uh, so, you know, position value in a different way. Uh, that doesn't sound like a very quick thing for government to get stuck into, though, does it? I think government struggles to respond to COVID. So, and that's like an emergency today. Um, I, I, I take your ask. I'm just worried that if that's the ask I go to government with, I may get a lot of scratching heads and not a lot of action. So next answer. Kastoff or Martin? Or both? Um, I was, uh, for me, it's, uh, I don't know if it's up to us as scientists to say it, but rather of the citizens. And uh, that's, I think, the, the simplest the only most important thing I think that can be done at the European level is to establish a citizen assembly on the ecological transition composed of 150 randomly selected European citizens who sit to deliberate about the policies that we should implement in order to transition uh, to a fair, sustainable, circular and whatever else we might want to call it society. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's really to democratize uh, power. And I think Kersey really uh, touched the point when she said power is the key thing that we have to talk about. And, um, and obviously political power is there, but obviously we, 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 that's where we should start and give the citizens the voice and the capacity to do it. And I will add uh, uh, very shortly, listen to the wisest person in the planet right now, Greta Thunberg. So all the European Commission and the UK politicians should listen to her. Good advice. Who's next down the panel? Come on, don't be shy. Yeah. Okay, I can uh, say something to this. So this is maybe a little bit more abstract, but I think that um, we need to think about the architecture of transitions a bit. Um, so right now we're sort of talking about transitions in terms of bringing kind of niches into the mainstream per se, but 
Transitions can also mean the collapse of a system, um, and we're talking about imagining new systems, but perhaps what we need to be asking our government in terms of power is um, not to shy away from looking at the collapse of dysfunctional systems. I like that. I like that a lot. Thank you. Gosca? Okay, so my... So I would like to contribute because when we we're talking about power, what came to my mind is just there are four... So we can talk about power over something. It's like domination. You're trying to force people to do some certain actions. And actually, I just came to my head when I was reading before, there are like different dimensions of power. So we can talk about power with, which means about collaborative uh, relationships with other people. It's also trying to build bridges within certain groups of people, including families or friends. So this can ultimately lead to the collective actions and the ability to act together. And then there is another dimension of power, which is about power too. So it's about like channeling some power to others for education, it's like sort of like empowering people and like uncovering potential of every person. So it's also important. And it's also linked to the capacity building schemes for the circular economy. And then there's another dimension of power, which is power within. So it's basically also uncovering the person's sense of self-worth. So then again, it links to the social enterprises and like this kind of aspect of inclusion. Like those people really need to realize that they are valuable members of the society. So it's super important also for this upcycling reuse practices. And yeah, and then it's about appreciating individual like creativity and empowering people to act. So overall, so we have just different dimensions of power and not just power over, just yeah, power with, power to and power within. And, so it's basically important to create conditions like where power can be shared while you are respecting individuality. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very powerful statement as well, by the way. I enjoyed that. Is there anybody else on the panel left with a, yeah. with a comment? I've got a, a last reflection. It's going to be maybe much more limited, but I think um, introduction to circular economy was very much touching on these issues of waste. And I think particularly in Northwestern Europe, where there is very high levels of consumption, high levels of waste generation that's very much maybe not dealt with at the point of source and very much exported, as Karsten was talking to other countries. So I was thinking as a, a practical, but maybe not slightly so interesting example, was creating a point of a distance between the point of consumption and the point of waste processing. And I think if we, uh, for example, while well, I live in the Netherlands, if we were exposed to the quantities of waste and things that we actually produce, then we'd be much more willing, I think, to actually deal with it and deal with our consumption pattern, deal with how much we're, we're using that's kind of, a, has a very short lifetime and throws away so quickly. I, I like that. Make, making it real, making it visible. Um, out of sight, out of mind has kind of let people off the hook for, for far too long, hasn't it? Good point. Um, right, let me hand back to the panel. I, uh, one, uh, we're going to go each in turn to reflect on what Cresting you know, specialists have just suggested, see what you think about those, do you like any of them or not? And then tell me what one piece of advice you would give the Cresting team going forward. What should they do next or where should they focus on? So Patrick, you're up first. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of good thoughts. Um, I, I especially like the one of um, empowering, um, using, using power to empower others um, to, make this, to make this change. And I, I think, um, especially, I mean, relating to your question, what should the UK or the UK, uh, EU governments do? Um, I think they, they should use their, their political power or their, um, uh, the power of governments that, that they have to uh, uh, make this trend, like, uh, transition happening. Um, I think I very much um, subscribe to uh, kind of this mission approach I think um, Mariana Mazzucato um, has written about this in, in her latest book, Mission Economy, um, about how to, yeah, how to reshape, reshape the economy and, and the role government plays. Um, I think that's a very good example of how power could be used in, in, in a very uh, good way, um, anticipating uh, the future and um, shaping it uh, in, a, in a way that's aligned with plenty of boundaries, but also um, the international dimensions, and um, I mean, more, more specifically, I would also like to see, for instance, the uh, the FCDR um, uh, and relating to the aid budget, that um, circular economy 
is more included into those uh, development cooperation programs. Um, there's a, a few good things happening. Um, so FCDO and UNCTAD, uh, for instance, have um, started with the Sustainable Manufacturing and Environmental Pollution Program, which, which supports uh, circularity in, in a range of uh, countries across the, across the world um, through UK uh, collaboration, for, for instance, with Nigeria. We are involved in one of the projects to set up, um, it's led by University of Warwick, and um, it's about uh, promoting domestic uh, Nigerian innovations uh, for uh, mobile recycling stations to be um, starting from a pilot but replicating these uh, in, in, in many other places. So I think some of these initiatives could also be interesting for Cresting to look at how research can work together um, in these um, uh, solution-focused um, uh, programs. Thank you, Patrick. Great advice. Uh, some great summary of key points as well. Thank you. Uh, Alawali, what's your thoughts? Yeah, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, closing remarks will be to, uh, it's good to have power, but power for what purpose? Uh, I think the power should be, uh, um, should be moved to the area of policy, because the policy that helps to transform the society. Uh, Yuriko has the Green Deal, and Africa has no deal yet. So I think there has to be a deal uh, for a just transition. And there are many things we can do. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we know what works and what works and needs to be institutionalized. So that's institution uh, that we strengthen uh, all our effort is what we should advocate. And that's what uh, uh, Africa Circular Economy Research and Policy Network uh, advocates in the continent. And we are open for collaboration. Let's do it for ourselves. And it will be a happy ending for all of us. We'll be happy because as a researcher, when your work comes to the table, I mean, you can feel that the people appreciate what you do and they take it up. We talk about research uptake. That's when you have the satisfaction. The satisfaction is not in the publication, but it is in the policy that is institutionalized. Thank you. Good advice, Alo Ali. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, the journey is very important. And, and, and I love the fact you talk about the deal or no deal. Last, last word for you, Kirsty. Where, where, where should they be heading? What should they do next? And, and did you like what they said or are you in total disagreement? Uh, <clears throat> that's a lot. Um, I was just coming back to what you asked them to suggest to the government. And I actually liked, I know you didn't like the value one, but I liked the value one. And maybe I'm thinking of value differently. But I was just reading some of the UK government's net zero policies. And, and it's just, it, again, you're sort of, sort of struck by the this narrative of, you know, yes, we can, but not in the positive Obama way, but in the kind of, I'm going to swear now, but in the kind of bullshit way, actually, that we're going to, big infrastructure, you know, um, carbon capture and storage project. It's this kind of utopian, talking about imaginaries, what kind of imaginary are we being sold here by net zero policies? And it's one where the future is bright because we're gonna build it and it's gonna sort it all out. So I don't know if that's what that person meant by value, but I think there is something there about actually reconstituting the values around, well, actually we're all a little bit in trouble and we need to do things a bit differently. Um, in terms of the cresting project, no, I appreciated the responses. I think actually Pauline and I were not making the same point. My point was that circular economy isn't about environment policies. So it's, it's fundamentally a social project, even if the interventions look environmental, it is social. And I guess it's like trying to trying to refocus energy on that. And I can suggest some kind of well, start with carbon democracy by Timothy Mitchell and kind of look at the the real. Um, relationship between the social material and engineering landscape and the socio-political landscape because they are inextricably linked in that way but no good responses good dialogue thank you thank you very much panel um, and we've got some good reading lists forming um, for, for the audience so hopefully somebody's capturing all these and we can circulate them afterwards um, back to the room is there any questions from the audience that have been raised on the um, 
on the chat function that I can't see. And if so, could somebody ask us an interesting one, please, as a final question? I'm not sure we can access that either. Actually, sitting here on the stage, we've lost our Zoom oh, link. You're down as much as we OK, fine. In which case, um, I'm, I'm conscious of time. We've got four minutes. I'm, I'm going to ask the cresting team then, so what next? Tell me where you're all going over the next 18 months, because I've lived the last two years. The amount of policy reform that's happening in Europe and the UK, for example, is, is unparalleled. I'm absolutely up to my eyeballs in consultations and formulations and impact studies and, and, and what if scenarios. So, you know, given, given the speed of, of policy reform that's happening around the world at the moment, what, what is next for, for, for the Cresting team and, and some of the researchers and their projects? Well, maybe I could answer that on a very prosaic level. People are writing up their PhDs or finalizing their publications. So there's a lot of very busy people uh, around. And if I can say, I much appreciate the time they've taken out from doing that to work on the conference. So that's probably top priority. Uh, we will be publishing a book with Routledge. So synthesizing some of those ideas and some of the thoughts that you've seen coming through today will be coming out Oh, just in time for Christmas next year, in fact. So put that in your diary. But even better news, that your, the book will be free. So what could wow. be better than that? Um, in terms of where the research goes from here, I think a certain amount of regrouping, thinking through what have we found, what have we not found, what are the questions that come up? And they're completely eluding me at this minute, I have to admit, but I'm sure there's some really good ones that we will be coming across in the coming months. Fabulous. And, and, and any of the researchers in particular? Has, has, has anyone got a, a, you know, a, a hot next thing they're moving on to that's going to change the world they want to share with me? I think we were all hoping you would offer us, uh, offer us a job, job Adam. <laughs> well, well, none of you want to work for a waste management company, surely. You know, you're, you're all far too imaginative and, 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 and power hungry for that. But um, talk to me offline, because we, we are definitely in transformation mode. <laughs> and on that, I'm going to say thank you very much to the panel. Uh, Alo Ali, Patrick and yeah, Kirsten. I, I, think for, I think for me, uh, I, I will want to... Uh, us to do more research into the continent, uh, Africa continent. Let's see what is actually driving circular economy or circular society. And maybe there's a next uh, so that we, maybe the trajectory or the transition the continent so that we can all uh, come together as a global village to fight the common enemy. That's what I think we should focus a very passionate plea from Alawali and I couldn't disagree with him. So well done. And yes, if anybody wants to develop a research project with Alawali, I'm sure he'll jump at the opportunity. So thank you to the panel. Fantastic contributions. Hopefully you prodded and cajoled and, and shared your insights, which has been fantastic. Um, a huge thank you to the organisers for putting on what's been an interesting hybrid event. Uh, apologies for not having so many people in the room, but needs must. So well done for, for keeping the lights on. Um, and most importantly, I thank you to the, um, to the researchers who have done some unbelievable research on a particularly complicated, somewhat difficult and, and nebulous and, 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 and hard to grapple with topic that, that needs more research. There's no doubt we all agree it needs more research. And then you can influence the policy debate. And I think that's the really interesting opportunity for all of you is what can you do in the next two or three years? to ensure that the transition is right and the trajectory is right and that we're actually having the right conversations about the right issues and not simply trying to make recycling better. Because if that's the conversation I'm having, then we've failed miserably. <laughs> so I've been Dr. Adam Reid. I am the External Affairs Director at Suez. I'm also the President of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management. My work here is done. Back to the RGS and to the experts in the room. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, Patrick, Kirsty, and Wale as well. That very well, brilliant contributions. Thank you. Adam, are you sure you're not a disc jockey in your spare time? Because I think you'd carry that off superbly well. <laughs>